Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Lance. Hello, Michael. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you for taking some time to uh, hang out with us this afternoon and have a quick discussion about some uh, key hydronic tips and a little review of CSA B214. My pleasure. Hello. Some of my favorite topics. Perfect. For those who are new, I'm Michael. Uh, I'm the Technical Services Manager at Eden Energy Equipments. I've been with Eden Energy now for 20 plus years. Uh, my responsibilities include uh, technical training, field startups, uh, design work, and, and frankly, working with our engineering and contractor partners on any questions they have. Lance and I were just having a conversation of how long have we known each other? So we've come to the conclusion it's been at least 10 years. Uh, Lance, tell everybody about yourself. Well, hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me here today. So I am in my day job, I am the Director of Engineering for the Building and Construction Division of the Plastics Pipe Institute, uh, otherwise known as PPI. And PPI is a, a nonprofit trade association uh, focused on plastic piping, obviously. Uh, in the division I work for, Building and Construction, we focus on pressure pipes used for plumbing and mechanical systems. So that's uh, materials like PEX and polypropylene, CPVC, PERT. Uh, that family of products. Awesome. So a uh, little disclaimer at the start of this training. Uh, obviously, Lance and I do not speak for CSA. Uh, that said, Lance and I are going to have a lengthy, well, not too lengthy, but a relatively lengthy chat here about CSA B214 and some of the key things we think you guys need to pay attention to. Obviously, uh, always follow the local jurisdiction and rules. And if at the end of this training you uh, go to bed tonight and wake up tomorrow morning and go, geez, I had a question about something Lance or Mike said. Uh, by all means, send me an email, reach out to me. Uh, Lance and I are both very approachable, and part of us giving our time to do this training is to try to give back and uh, engage with people in our community. So as we move along, uh, everybody's going to be on mute, but if you do have a question, please feel free to type the question in, and we'll either address it as it comes up, or if not, we will definitely address it at the end as we do our live Q&A component. So with that said, we're going to move on to the first one. Uh, so Lance, our, our first uh, sort of question comment of the day is, how much insulation do I need to have under a radiant slab? Well, obviously, that's a really fundamental question about doing radiant right. Um, and I think everybody probably has the idea that, yes, yeah, some insulation is good. Um, obviously, the benefits of having some insulation under a slab uh, are efficiency, because the cold earth below a heated slab uh, can really suck a lot of heat out of a heated floor. And in fact, if you've got a relatively high water table and conductive earth, uh, some thermal models have shown that the earth could suck 50% of the heat out of the slab. So that means you almost need to double the size of your boiler and your equipment if the earth is sucking 50% of the heat out of the slab. So yeah, some insulation is obviously important. Uh, there is a point of diminishing returns where if you went from two inches to four inches, you're not necessarily saving twice as much downward heat transfer though. So CSA B214, it's sensitive to all of that stuff. And what it requires is R5. So that's pretty much equivalent to one inch of good quality foam board. If you're using extruded foam board, one inch of that would be enough to qualify for, CB, uh, for B214. But I'm sure you've seen a lot of cases where people are using more than that. Um, and there's obviously benefits of using a little bit more inch and a half or two inch is, uh, is pretty common. Yeah, awesome, Lance. So I've put together uh, a quick cutaway just to sort of show what the expectation, uh, if Lance or I or you know any of our manufacturing partners were expecting uh, insulation to be installed properly, it, it would look like the illustration on the left, uh, which comes to us uh, courtesy of Ray Howe. So the things I wanna point out on top of what Lance has already identified is that a lot of people get the bottom insulation right, uh, the part that they seem to miss is the side insulation. You need to make sure you do have that thermal break. The other thing that we'll see is people will forget that you also want to have between the subgrade and the insulation that vapor bed. You want to have that gap so you make sure that no moisture uh, gets up into that insulation. Uh, once the insulation is wet, its uh, value to your project is, uh, is quite limited. The other thing I wanted Lance to sort of chime in on here is you'll notice uh, that we have the pipe uh, in Ray House illustration it's more towards the, the middle of the pipe or uh, middle of the concrete. The idea of that is we want to make sure it doesn't take a huge amount of time and energy to heat that slab. We want it in the middle, nice and even. In the photo to the right, we're seeing a very common installation where people are using uh, panels. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, I know a lot of our customers do that, but 
Lance, you do want to just touch quickly on one of the things that could be a concern in that application? Sure. Well, I think, yeah, I think all the research up to now, whether it was uh, FEA thermal research or actual field studies, have shown that the ideal location for the tubing is two to three inches down from the top surface of the concrete. So that's 50 to 75 millimeters if we're speaking metric. Um, if you go lower than that, it simply means your heated pipe is farther from the surface that you're trying to, to drive the heat up through. So that means it's going to take longer uh, to transfer the heat up. It's going to take longer to change the temperature. So in the evening when the sun goes down and the heat load, the heat loss goes up, um, it's going to take a little bit you know, more time to, to warm up the surface of the floor to match, to match the increased heat load. Um, and concrete itself is not a wonderful conductor of heat. It's, it's okay, but it's not the best in the world. So again, the, farther, the more concrete that you'd have to drive that temperature through, uh, you may have to increase the water temperature inside the pipe as well. And we all know the benefits of lower water temperature for more efficiency of a condensing boiler or geothermal heat pump or air source heat pump. Um, so building the system with the tubing farther from the top surface it does cost you a little bit in response time and efficiency. Yeah, so certainly we've seen, uh, I'm sure you've been there, Lance, I've been to projects where they th they pour a really thick pad, it's like a really fancy architectural home, and then the complaint is that my house is overheating. You know, you go out, you look at the place, you got a really thick slab, and by the time that slab gets the temperature, the sun is beating down through those windows, it's the office of the nighttime effect, they're going, hey, how do I cool this space off? Which also leads into a conversation we're gonna have in a few minutes, they have the floor sensors, so by the time the slab is at temperature, uh, I mean, the thermostat can't see it, right? So it just keeps pumping heat into the space, uh, resulting in problems. So proper insulation, make sure the pipe spacing is correct. And Lance and I are not poo-pooing the floor on the right. We're just saying be aware of what you got. It's a very thick floor. Be conscious of, of where the piping is in that space. Leading to the next one, uh, Lance, what is the maximum design temperature for a radiant floor? Okay, well, the key word in what you just said is maximum, um, because the numbers I'm going to give you are not target design temperatures. These are the maximums that are allowed by various codes out there. And so the number I'm going to give you is the number of the maximum surface temperature. It's also not the temperature of the concrete or not the temperature of the fluid inside the pipe. It's the maximum allowable temperature on the surface that, you're, that your foot stands on. Um, and according to CSA B214, and this was updated a couple of years ago, back in 2016, the maximum allowable floor surface temperature for occupied spaces is 84 degrees Fahrenheit or 29 degrees Celsius. And that seems like kind of a random number, um, but that number, 29 degrees Celsius, uh, is based on several studies that were done in Europe years ago. And it was adopted a while back into the ASHRAE standard called ASHRAE standard 55, which is thermal environmental conditions for human occupancy. It's the ASHRAE standard that Robert Bean has had a lot of say in over the years. Uh, it's really the ASHRAE standard about keeping people comfortable in a space. So basically it says that 29 degrees Celsius, 84 degrees Fahrenheit, that's the maximum allowable surface temperature and general occupied spaces but there's a few exceptions. Do I have time to list the you exceptions? Do. Give us okay. the exceptions. So the exceptions are, let's say, in a bathroom. Uh, in a bathroom, you don't probably work there with a desk on the floor. You're not sitting there all day long. So the floor is allowed to be a little bit hotter in a bathroom, uh, up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit in a bathroom floor, if you need that much heat. Uh, and the challenge with heating some bathrooms, if they have a big exposed outside wall, you don't have a lot of surface area in the floor available because you've got a big tub there, shower pan, stuff like that. So you can go as hot as 90 degree Fahrenheit in the floor if you need to. Um, and outside wall perimeter areas, which is typically defined as the first two and a half or three feet in from all the outside walls of a house, you can go as hot as 95 degrees floor temperature if you need to, uh, to meet the heat load because people generally don't put their chair right against the outside wall. There's probably some space there or a piece of furniture, but not, not your feet. Um, and then in industrial areas, which could be like the floor of a warehouse or a factory floor, uh, the maximum allowable is 88 degrees because in a case like that, people probably have work boots on, their feet aren't touching the floor directly. Um, so those are maximum numbers and that's all in CSA B214, clause 14.2.1 if anybody is taking notes. 
Um, and again, those aren't the target temperatures for every design. That's just as high as you can go. Yeah, and I think an easy way, Lance, of sort of putting that in perspective for everybody is we, we have two photos, uh, no issues with them at all. They're, they're two different applications completely. So you've got on the left-hand side, a more traditional system, and on the right-hand side, you've got a RAL panel system. So a lot of people, uh, even me, before I had the design knowledge and met people like yourself, wouldn't immediately make the connection that both of these systems could run at 120 degrees. The one on the left might put out 15 BTUs per square foot, and the one on the right is definitely putting out 28 BTUs per square foot. So, you know, having that sensor in there is, is very critical to make sure that we're not overheating that space. Because again, with an air sensing thermostat, by the time that gets to temperature, it's not gonna stop. It just keeps pumping BTUs into that space. More to Lance's point, there's a lot of research out there and Lance points to ASHRAE and he certainly points to both of ours mutual good friend, Mr. Bean, uh, who has educated us on a lot of things. The big takeaway in this is for everybody to understand that you know air temperature is one of the least contributing factors when it comes to thermal comfort. The fact that Lance is wearing a suit in his photo and I'm much more fashionable on a t-shirt is gonna contribute as much to thermal comfort uh, as what the air temperature is. And if you look at the mean radiant temperature chart on the right hand side that comes to us from architectural forum, you can actually see that when the mean radiant temperature is higher, we can reduce the air temperature. And this is not new research. Harvard research is available on this going back to the 50s and 60s. And kudos to ASHRAE and people like Robert Bean and even John Siegenthaler and Lance for taking the time to educate people that radiant temperature is a really big contributing factor. We have to pay attention to it. And we definitely want to be able to control that. You can have scenarios where you could have the floor be at 82, 83 degrees and the actual air temperature could be 68 degrees and you're perfectly comfortable. Whereas a lot of us are used to furnaces where we go, I got to set it to 72 and I got to set it to 74. So that's not actually true when it comes to thermal comfort. Yeah, we'll even so think- This is a good one too. We don't talk a lot about 3 8 tubing. So what is the actual maximum loop circuit length allowed for 3 8 radiant tubing? So, the maximum allowed to go back to CSA B214, um, there is a table in there that lists the maximum allowable tubing lengths for the different diameters. And for three eighths, it says 250 feet. But that's kind of a that's kind of a lowest common denominator answer without any kind of design information being provided, because the real maximum is it depends. It depends on how fast is the flow rate going? How many BTUs are you trying to put out per foot length of tubing? Uh, how much heat does the room need that you're supplying with 3 8 tubing? So there's a lot of cases where 3 8 tubing could actually be a 300 or a 330 foot circuit length. If the heat loss isn't so high, the water could still travel that long and not lose too much heat. And normally we try to design all our uh, delta T temperature drops around a maximum of 20 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Um, and then the key driver to that is also the circulating pump. I mean, you could make a 500 foot circuit of 3 8 tubing, as long as you have a large enough circulator in there that's making enough pressure to overcome the head loss in 500 feet of 3 8 tubing. Physically, it could work. It's not good engineering. It's not good efficiency, um, but it could work. So, so CSA B214, uh, what it says, just to read you verbatim, it says the maximum maximum length of continuous tubing shall not exceed the length specified by the manufacturer. Inclu and that refers to the fact that there would be a manufacturer's design, assuming the manufacturer is doing an actual heat loss design and a circuit by circuit pipe layout. Uh, but then it says, or in the absence of manufacturer specifications, use the length specified in table one. And table one is the one that says 250 feet for 3 8 tubing. Yeah, and so to Lance's point, uh, we've both been involved. Lance worked with Ray Howe for many years. That's where we met. Uh, and so I have been involved in jobs where people have run 3 8 tubing too long. And I don't just call Lance up or call Dale Hanscom up and say, hey, uh, this guy ran it to 400 feet. That's okay, right? No, we're going to do the calculations. And the phone call I had with Lance when he was still in his Ray Howe days is, this is what they've done. This is the pressure drop. Can I get a sign off to say that, yes, we will accept this as a resolution? Typically, what we would do, and I'm, I'm sure that I don't speak for Ray Howe, but they would do the same thing, is that, Whatever the code says, we're going to stay within 10%. So if it's 300 feet, we might go to 330, but there's no reason for 3 8 tubing that we would be running that out to, I'm referring to half inch, you wouldn't be running that out to 300, 330 feet, because at the end of the day, you're going to run into some significant challenges from a pumping standpoint. 
one of the things that I've seen a lot of, and, and Lance and I've included a little slide to talk about it, is there's a little bit of a disconnect. And I just want to be clear, I'm talking about inside of a home right now. I'm not talking about a snow melt application. So if you look at a house, a lot of people will do half inch tubing because they're like, wow, it's got way more BTUs out of a half inch piece of pipe than a three eighths piece of pipe. Well, unfortunately, that's just not true. So in this chart, we're actually showing you what the BTU output is for the different sizes of pipe. So it does change, but really what comes into play is, can you pump it? Does it make sense? Uh, the 3 8 tubing is going to be a better option for you. It's going to be less expensive. You can bend it tighter in those bathrooms where you need it. It's easier to conceal. If I'm doing my bathroom and just want to hide the tubing in the wall, there's a lot of things you can do with it. But to Lance's point, regardless of what size tubing you're choosing, make sure you are following CSA and that you're not running 500 foot circuits of 3 8 tubing or half inch tubing. Well, and the truth is, Michael, there are some cases if you're doing a real high heat loss area, uh, or even doing a 250 foot circuit of 3 8 tubing, uh, maybe too much without a without a unusually large circulating pump, because if you're trying to suck a lot of heat out of that floor, by the time the water has traveled 250 feet, uh, it may be cold already. Um, so the 250 feet that's just kind of a rule of thumb, but there's lots of cases where more or less is actually the right answer. Yeah, I think the good news is that you you don't have to guess. You know, the the, ga the days of guessing are gone. I know that when I was still in the field doing installations, I didn't have the opportunity to call somebody like Lancer, and I didn't deal with a supplier who had somebody like me or Cody on our team who get paid to take calls and answer customers' questions. You shouldn't have to wing it. There's no reason for it. Make a phone call, provide a PDF. I mean, our team can put it into CAD very quickly and tell you this is what you need to do, this is what you shouldn't do. Um, you know, I see the same thing, Lance, where people confuse PEX and copper. And I had one last week where it's, you know, I just buried this one inch PEX and I ran it about 170 feet. Now I need to make this work. It's like, how many BTUs? And when you hear the number, you go, whew, okay, we got to do some thinking here because it's a little bit light. So moving on, uh, the other topic that we wanted to touch on is specifically has to do with uh, why balancing of radiant loops is so important. So Lance, just walk us through CSA's requirement now for balancing. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, and then we'll have to get into kind of the real practical explanation of what balancing really means, because balancing doesn't necessarily mean that all circuits have the same flow rate, right? Um, but what CSA B214 says, and again, this is in, uh, it's actually addressed in two points. There's a clause called clause 12.5.1.1 that says, a means for balancing all heat distribution units in system loops shall be provided, and the system shall be balanced according to the design. So that's not just for radiant, that's for all hydronics. So if you, whether you have baseboard in every room or panel radiators in every room of a house or a school, um, each of those rooms has its own heat loss, which is probably different from the room next door, depending on the size and the exposure to the outdoors and everything else. So the point of that clause is that old units need to be balanced. Um, and then within the radiant section of B214, there's something specific that says system loops shall be installed so that the, the design flow rates are achieved within the system. So yeah, that's a great example of what you've got in the screen there now, what we mean when we say design flow rates. It's based on so the heat loss. Probably one of the most common obstacles we run into is we get a phone call and hey, the system's not working right. And typically, and I'm just gonna go back one slide. Uh, this is this has nothing to do with it though. You know, you'll have a scenario like this. Uh, in this application, they put in a pro balance mixing module or pro balance uh, manifold, pardon me, uh, be, with actuators on it fed by an ECM pump. And, and Lance and I are gonna talk about that in a little bit. And so what we've seen, again, not in the job that uh, Mitch and his team did, where they'll do all this, but then they miss the critical component to what Lance just said. If they just go in and say, well, whatever these you know, balancing valves are set at is what they're set at, it's not good. Any more than you saying, I'm just gonna set them all to half a gallon a minute. If you look at this scenario, so this is a, a heat loss that was provided to us by a customer named Jeff. Uh, he would give us that heat loss. We would then in turn put all of that into CAD. And then as we finalize that, you'll actually get a table along with the drawing. And Lance and I had a bit of back and forth of, I wonder how many people look at the table. I mean, we tell people to, but us telling the install manager or the service manager, we got to make sure that trickles down to the installer. Because to Lance's point, you can see our first circuit here is at 0.2 gallons a minute. 
second circuit's at 0.56. Like these are very specific flow rates that were specified around the loads provided and a 20 degree delta T. So if we don't set these properly, we're gonna have situations where my sunroom's too warm, my bathroom's too cold. You know, there's a lot to this and having balancing manifolds, we've always done that. And honestly, I've never understood how people get away from it. It starts with a heat loss, it then goes into CAD and then you're presented back a nice material list. You know exactly what you need, but you also have a really nice table that shows you what those flow rates should be. Well, and let's just use those first two circuits as an example. Circuit A1 is just 142 feet long. Circuit A2 is 287. If you don't do any balancing and you have the same pump pressure going to that manifold with those two circuits side by side, uh, one circuit is half the length of the other. So nat natural balancing would mean that the shorter circuit actually gets more flow rate because there's less pressure loss. But in fact, that's the exact opposite of what the system actually needs because a longer circuit it's probably longer because it's covering more area. It's a bigger room, which probably has more heat loss than a smaller room. So if you don't do any balancing, you're gonna deliver the exact opposite flow rates to those two circuits. Um, but balancing in the manifold, most of the manifolds nowadays, nowadays have flow gauges on them. And with a key, you can throttle down the flow into the short circuit uh, to restrict the flow into the short one. And then that forces the flow into the longer one. And so with just a couple of turns of a knob or a key, you can achieve this balancing. And it's really, really important to do that. Yeah, there's no question that balancing is, is absolutely critical. That's a great point, Lance, to sort of show everybody. Um, if you looked at the cost, because uh, I have a customer uh, who went through this exercise with me many years ago going, I build my own. It's actually much less expensive to buy a pre-built manifold. The costs have come down significantly. You can ensure comfort. And if you're not putting in a manifold that you can balance, whether it's made by Rehau or, or whoever, I don't care. At the end of the day, you're not delivering that design. That, the heat loss that you see here is completely irrelevant. You might as well have not got one because you have no idea what BTUs you're putting in each room. And buying a packaged one is going to be much less expensive. And best of all, the manufacturer's warranty is typically better than the guy who built it. Right? Your warranty is whatever you feel like honoring that day. So definitely very, very important that you use the proper manifold. That also does bring up the discussion of how do we handle it when different zone valves open and close lands. So yeah, CSAB 214 addresses this one as well. Um, and the topic that we're discussing here is, so we've got a manifold with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven circuits. So that means that the circulator is sized to pump enough fluid for when all, all seven circuits are open and demand is at its peak. But that doesn't happen a lot because morning sun could be warming up half the house and those thermostats could be turning off. So if three or three or four of those thermostats are turned off, that means three or four of those zone valves are closed. The circulator was sized for pumping enough flow for all seven, but now only three remain open. So if you continue to keep the circulator going as it was going, now it's trying to push too much flow th into those three zone valves that remain open and those rooms can overheat. And you're also kind of wasting energy because uh, pushing more flow through uh, less circuits builds up more pressure, higher velocity. Um, it's moving the whole pump back and it's pump operating curve and, and consuming more pumping energy as well. So there's two ways of fixing that mechanically. Um, and by the way, CSA B214, like I said, addresses this and it even says, and I'll quote again, it says, provision shall be made to prevent excessive zone flows in a multi-zone hydronic system where the closing of some or all of the two-way zone valves can cause excessive flow through the open zones or deadheading of a fixed speed circulator. So one solution is to use a variable speed circulator, which senses the pressure buildup in the system as some of those zone valves close off and slows itself down. Or you can also get devices called pressure differential bypass valves that are spring check valves that start to open up when the pressure builds up and allows fluid to bypass around the manifold um, so that you're not building up extra pressure and that the circuits that remain open uh, continue to receive the target flow rate that they should be getting. So you got a picture of all that stuff right there. Yeah, so this is an interesting conversation. When, when Lance and I first met, Lance was a very big proponent for ECM pumps. He was exactly right in that. 
but Lance and I have a great relationship where we can be candid. And I would always say to Lance, the ECM pumps, that's a great idea. But 10 years ago, that ECM pump was $400. The ECM pump we're referring to would have been similar to the 0018 on the right. And uh, the differential pressure bypass in the middle was only like two and a quarter. So it became a, yeah, the ECM pump makes sense. But at this point, the bypass makes a lot more sense just from a, a cost standpoint. Now it's a, a complete rural reversal. And Lance and I were just talking about that. So regardless of what you do, your system needs a pump. Well, now that ECM pump is literally $100, right? So you're, you're paying maybe 5 or $10 more than a PSC pump. So you might as well go the ECM route, and then you don't even have to worry about, did I set up this differential bypass properly? The pump is very easy to set up. Uh, and the other thing that's very interesting, there's more options available to us now. So, for example, the pump on the left, which is uh, Velo's new Maxo pump, it's pretty cool. So it'll run on pressure. It'll run on delta T that we can specify. So, you know, Lance and I work and we design that great big house that's got radiant floor everywhere. And we tell it we want it to be on a 10 degree delta T. The other thing that's really cool is that that pump and, and others have the ability what's called a flow stop. So that pump can actually stop automatically as soon as it sees no flow in the system. So not only are you giving them comfort, but you're making your life easier as a designer and a contractor because there's no low voltage wiring involved. So you know, technology has come a long ways and we can achieve what CSA wants in a variety of different ways. And it doesn't mean it needs to be complicated. So, you know, 10 years ago, I'd say, Lance, I'm putting the bypass on. It makes more sense. It's more cost effective. You know, Lance was just ahead of the curve or he didn't care about the price, which is probably not wrong, right? <laughs> price doesn't dictate everything. Guys say that about the manifolds. Oh, those balancing manifolds are too much money. Yeah, but it's not going to work right, you know? Here, yeah, either or works right. But the reality is, I can't tell you the last time I put a bypass on. You know, it's so much easier to do it, whether it's a 0018 from Keiko or a Maxo pump from uh, from Velo. Well, well, Michael, one of the, um, to your point there, a lot of my hydronic, let's say, theories and feelings are based on exposure to Europe. Uh, I was lucky enough to go to the ISHO over in Germany starting back in the 1990s. And holy cow, the technology in the 1990s of Germany compared to North America was night and day. Um, they were about 20 or 30 years ahead of us over there. And I realized it's not always about just making the system simpler and cheaper. It's about making it better. Um, if we're doing radiant heating or, or hydronics in general, uh, you probably have an audience or a customer that's interested in a better system. So sometimes ju it just takes a few other refinements to truly make it a better system. Because you could build bad radiant systems if you don't balance them right. It can still be a poorly functioning radiant system, despite the fact that you installed thousands of feet of tubing in the floor. Um, so even when you're using these these variable speed circulating pumps, it's also important to balance those correctly and to mm -hmm. set them up. And back to your design a few slides ago, your design showed what the total flow rate should be and what the maximum head loss should be. So whoever installs that circulator just make, needs to make sure that they actually set it up to, to, to not over pump the system, but to have the right capacity. Yeah, and I think one of the things that's interesting too, Lance, and it's something you learn with time, and I, I know I remind myself of this daily, is that you have to self-assess as the installer and as the builder that just because it's something that you think makes sense doesn't mean it truly does. You know, some people will look at this and go, this this mix or this manifold, this balancing manifold is just too much money as far as I'm concerned. At the end of the day, you're putting your own budget expectations on an end user. And I'm pretty sure if you sat down with them and said, hey, by the way, we're not going to put a differential bypass on this. And it's it's going to like work. You may not like it. They'd probably ask, how much more am I paying on this $50,000 system to make it work perfectly? And when we're talking hundreds of dollars, it's really a matter of sort of self-assessing and, you know, not in stealing your own ideas where they really just aren't right. Listen to the customer, talk to the customer. And part of it, I went through this actually with a customer yesterday, Jeff, is Sometimes the customer is wrong and you just got to walk away. You know, it's uh, it's just a reality. It's sometimes you have to do what's right. And certainly with CSA, we're hoping you're going to try to follow as many of these rules as possible. So moving on to the next one, uh, how much installation, installation do I need below a radiant subfloor when it's on the main floor? Yeah, that's a good one. And uh, that section of B214 actually changed. And we should mention... Uh, probably everybody who's on the webinar today was on one of the webinars back in February where we spent a whole hour going through the latest updates to CSA B214, the installation code for hydronic heating systems. 
because the, the latest edition of that was just published in January 15th this year. Uh, and a lot of things got updated and changed, but there was a lot of good content in B214 already. Um, some of it got tweaked, some new stuff got added. Uh, on the topic of this section right here, so we're talking about not an overpour for gradient teething, but we're talking about a panelized system, which could be made of plywood or OSB or MDF or aluminum panels or something like that, some sort of combination. And if we're talking about the main floor of a house, I'm assuming that it's conditioned space down below, meaning you have a heated basement down below or something like that. So this is not about being over a cold crawl space, which I know is not so common um, in a lot of these areas anyway. So B214 used to require R12 insulation under a panelized heated floor like that, but that's actually been reduced this time. And now it's down to R5 because if you have heated space down below, um, there's not a great propensity for the heat in the floor to go down versus up. Uh, you still don't want to overheat the basement down below um, and having a little bit of insulation in the joist cavity helps to make sure all the heat gets directed upwards and you get faster response time and all of that. Uh, but that section of the code changed from requiring R R R12 to now just R5, which is achieved pretty easily. And that's in clause 14.5.3.3, if anybody wants to check that in their own copy. Yeah, so I think one of the other things that we should talk about here too, Lance, is that uh, let's go below the floor, I guess. So this is a good illustration of uh, row board and row panel that go on the floor. Let's look at two other scenarios and talk about the installation component to it. So the other option would be to put plates up. So in, in the Ray Hall world, it's called row plate. It's a great product. So if you were putting row plate up, so that's a extruded metal where the pipe sits inside of it. Would you push the insulation all the way up against the plates or would you leave a small air gap? And then let's have the same conversation where we're talking about just regular staple up where I'm just putting pipes up and I'm just gonna staple them. And again, would you put the insulation directly against it or would you leave a little bit of a gap? Hmm, okay, so that's a two part question. So for the first part where I'm doing joist space heating from the basement ceiling and I am using aluminum heat transfer plates. That was the first part of the question, right? Correct. So in that case, there's not really a need for any kind of an air gap. Uh, you do need to have insulation under that. Um, and CSA B214 doesn't tell you anything about needing an air gap in that case. So you can actually have that insulation pushed right up against the bottom of those plates because those plates are basically conductive fins. Uh, they suck the heat off the tubing conductively, it gets transferred from the tubing surface into the aluminum plate, and the aluminum plate spreads it out against the bottom of the subfloor. Um, a little bit of an air gap is not a bad thing in that case, because it allows the heat to spread out a little more in between where the plates are. If you're not using any plates, and you literally just have the tubing stapled up to the bottom of the subfloor, there's really not much contact between the tubing and the subfloor. I mean, the top of a circle, um, it's a tiny little bit of contact. So in that case, what you're doing is you're relying on the whole surface of the tubing to give heat off to the air in the joist cavity space. So you're basically making like a hot air plenum under your subfloor in the joist cavities. And you do actually want a bit of an air gap there below the bottom of the subfloor so that that air will take the heat that it gets off the tubing and, and spreads it around. So the CSA B214 uh, says that that air gap has to be between one and three inches or 25 to 75 millimeters. So that's measured from the bottom of the subfloor down and then the tubing is within that air gap space. So it could be a total of one inch air gap or two inches or all the way down to three inches. Uh, more than that just means you're making more hot air than what you need to and slowing down the response time of the system. So that's why there's a, an upper limit there. Yeah, I think that uh, it's important to note too, Lance, that, you know, things have changed quite a bit. There's better research out there. I know that uh, John Siegenthaler, a friend of both of ours, has uh, has been very adamant in the research of, of how to properly insulate below systems. But, you know, we'll steal a line from him when we point out that staple up. And again, where we're talking, you just staple it to the joists without any plating on it. It's a constipated heating system, right? If you shove insulation up against that pipe, the BTUs aren't going anywhere. They're, they're staying inside of that pipe. It's it's not a good situation. 
the reality is that using a plate system, especially a plate system that holds both pipes, you can install it faster. It's got better BTU output. It runs at a cooler water temperature. And when you look at your labor costs, because we've done this firsthand in the field, it's actually much faster to install. So you're not paying a premium and you're delivering a system that works. The other problem with staple up is people get very creative. Like staple up with the joists are like this, it doesn't get stapled to the joists. You know, we joke about that, but at least twice a year, I will get a phone call followed up by a photo of this is the staple up that just got put in. So traditional staple up, not a huge fan. Lance, any thoughts or you want to not take the bait on regular staple up? <laughs> well, listen, just uh, everybody's familiar with uh, hydronic baseboard heating. Um, imagine hydronic baseboard without the fins. So if you had just a piece of three quarter copper tube inside your hydronic baseboard with no aluminum fins, imagine how well that would work. Uh, and then compare that to what we actually do is we press all these aluminum fins every half inch apart or so on that three quarter tube, because that just shows you that aluminum is a great conductor of heat and more surface area does a better job of transferring the heat energy. Uh, it's the same as using heat transfer plates in the joist cavity. Without the heat transfer plates, it's analogous to running hot, hot water baseboard without the fins. <laughs> For sure. Now we're getting a lot of great questions. As everybody knows, I'm not ignoring you. We're gonna answer all your questions at the end. I am gonna grab Craig's really quickly because I'm realizing that perhaps we should have had a slide that showed staple up and, and this uh, plate we're talking about. Craig is just asking, is the tubing below the plywood? And, and that is correct. So in the scenario that we're talking about right now, uh, this is all below the subfloor. Uh, these in the photos are obviously on top of the subfloor. If, if I haven't hinted that right, Craig, you've got my email address. If not, hopefully you have my phone number to follow up with me after or just uh, hit us with a follow-up question here. Uh, moving on, we're going to talk a little bit about snow melts. Uh, so, Lance, how much insulation do I need under a hydronic snow melting slab? And that's a great question, too, because I think uh, because most snow melt systems are on-off systems, most of them don't run, you know, five months of the year. That would be a huge consumer of energy. Um, so it's almost more important for snow melt to have insulation down below than it is for radiant heating. Because with radiant, it's pretty much always on, you're adjusting the temperature, uh, but you're not turning it on and off a whole lot. Whereas, yeah, with snow melt, they're, they're on off. So what CSA B214 says, it's similar to the radiant heating requirement in that you need a minimum of R5 insulation, and that's in clause 17.5. Uh, in fact, the whole of chapter 17, uh, chapter 17 of CSA B214 is on snow and ice melt, so there's more information than just uh, insulation requirements. But it's a minimum of R5, but I think for a lot of people, practically speaking, they use more than that because one and a half or two inches thick uh, obviously works better, but it's also even just stronger for surviving the foot traffic during construction. So uh, most of the jobs I've seen, people are using one and a half or two inch thickness of insulation, which is fantastic. Yeah, you obviously want to be very conscious of the fact that some of the people that are going to be walking on this, uh, they don't care if they break it, you know, getting the wheelbarrows and getting them on the end of the pipe. We've, we've seen just about everything on it. Um, we sort of just want to reiterate, so we have a very similar photo, again, courtesy of our good friends at Ray Howe, uh, just like with the insulation conversation we had earlier, you want to make sure you, ha you have that thermal break on the outside. Uh, you don't want to have the heat going into the lawn or the garden. You know, Lance and I joke, we'll be growing tulips in the wintertime. Uh, we don't want to do that. My wife might like actually having her tulips grow in the wintertime. I'm, I'm not going to find out though. It's going to be quite the energy hog. Really the only other thing that I sort of want to circle back on this is where Lance and I were speaking earlier about the whole BTO output by pipe. One of the most common mistakes that I see is people saying, well, in a house, I'm using half inch pipe and I'm running 300 feet, it works, no problem. I'm going to do the exact same thing for my snow melt system. And then usually I'll get to the, the conversation of, Nobody's ever complained, Mike, so I know it works. And my really polite counter is, well, that's because they didn't call you to fix it, right? They, they called the guy who knows what he's doing to come back in and try to address <laughs> it. Uh, there's a significant difference in pressure drop of Lance putting 15 BTUs per square foot through a half inch piece of pipe and me then deciding I'm going to put 150 BTUs per square foot through a half inch piece of pipe. So CSA was updated. You can use half inch pipe. You cannot run it crazy long lengths. They have very specific short lengths. Um, obviously, we always follow CSA, but at the end of the day, sort of like that heat loss conversation, you shouldn't be in a scenario where you're winging it. Uh, 
uh, you know, we accept napkin sketches. It's not ideal, but for a snow melt, they're usually a very similar shape. You email it to us, you text it to one of our technical team and say, this is what I got. We're not rule of thumbing it. We're gonna put it in the CAD, we're gonna figure out how many BTUs, what's the pressure drop, what's the flow. So you don't get into that situation where, uh, you know, my neighbor's got snow melt and it seems to melt really good. Mine only melts in certain spots. And, you know, Lance and I usually start with, I bet you it melts in the beginning. <laughs> so Lance, any, any final adders to that? Well, yeah, since you mentioned the loop lengths, um, in CSAB 214, table two is on loop lengths for snow melt systems. And it, like you said, it, it does allow half inch tubing, but with a maximum loop length of 150 feet um, and a maximum active loop length of 130 feet. And that takes into account maybe 10 foot liters on either end of the circuit. So much, much lower than in a radiant heating system. Um, and the truth is, if you're in a snow melt system with a high load requirement, um, yeah, you're, well, you're gonna get a lot of benefit by having tighter, tighter tube spacing as well. Um, tighter tube spacing means there's a lot more surface contact between the tubing and the concrete. Um, so I would put my money into tighter tube spacing, shorter circuit lengths, uh, slightly larger manifold with extra circuits on the manifold, and uh, as opposed to just going to the maximum size tubing, but uh, tight tube spacing at short circuits is the, probably the most simple and most cost-effective way of building a fast response snow melt system. Yeah, so somebody's you know front couple of steps, uh, half inch would be really easy to work with, right? It's it's great to work with. Uh, you can bend it very tight. It's it's a great way to do it, but. Somebody that says, hey, I want to do the first section of my driveway, uh, I would tend to gravitate towards three-quarter. My experience shows it works. The other thing, too, is that, or maybe five-eighths. Um, if you wanted to do half-inch to Lance's point, don't forget the second part where Lance is saying you can do it in the half-inch because he's right. There's going to be more circuits, bigger manifolds, you know, more components to it. But again, the biggest thing Lance and I just want to encourage is don't wing it. You don't have to. You know, choose to work with people like Lance, like myself, that are you know willing to spend the time to share the the information on on how to do it properly. Lance, are you able to share the side of the length since you have the standard in front of you for the five eighths and the three quarter, just so they know what it is? Yeah. So on the snow melting side, the five eighths can go up to two hundred and twenty five feet maximum active loop length. This is where one half uh, half inch was one thirty feet, five eighths is two twenty five feet, and three quarter inch is three hundred feet. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And and obviously, just be aware again. We put a lot more BTUs through that pipe. Uh, be aware that the pressure drop is is going to be significant. It's it's not going to be a, a fifteen fifty eight or a double O fifteen pumping. It's it's going to be quite significant. You want to pay attention. To. Well, right. And a, you know, a hospital entrance in uh, Yukon Territory probably requires a lot more BTUs per square foot as compared to your driveway in Guelph, Ontario. So not all snowmobile right systems. Again. They're sized for different loads depending on what the demand is. Yeah, exactly right. When so I'm when I'm giving you that number, most people when they look at a residential driveway go, ah, oh, 95 BTUs. I don't. I go much higher than that. And Lance is rightly putting on even my 150. Uh, if this is the casino in Niagara Falls or the hospital in Toronto, they're going to be double that easily. Like they they don't want to get that. Oh, you know, somebody fell or a paramedic slipped or a patient incoming cracked their head. Uh, they want to make sure that there is no snow and Better yet, there's no ice as a result of the snow that was melted. So yeah, uh, this is a good one, uh, Lance. What sort of special things do you have to pay attention to when you're installing plastic pipe into a commercial return air plant? Ooh, so this is a tricky one when it comes. This is really a you know a, a health safety life uh, life question because the return air plenum of a commercial building is used as well. Obviously, the return air plenum. Um, so that means if there's any combustible materials up there, they have to be tested and certified uh, to have a low flame and smoke spread. And so you can't just put anything up there unless it's certified for that application. So this has been in the building code, the national building code for many years. This requirement was recently added into B214 um, just to make sure everybody knows it. So what I'm referring to now is a new clause called 9.2.8, which is about installation of non-metallic piping in return air plenums. And basically what it says is for any piping materials to be put in a return air plenum, 
the materials have to comply with, and this is a standard, CAN slash ULC S102.2. And that's the number of a test method where they actually take pieces of pipe or, or other products that could be up in a plenum. But in our case, they actually take 20 foot long pieces of pipe and set them on fire on purpose inside a device called the Steiner Tunnel. And by applying flame to one end of the pipe, they actually measure how quickly does the pipe catch on fire, how quickly does the flame spread, and then how much smoke is developed off the burning pipe, uh, basically polluting the air inside that tunnel. So that standard number uh, prescribes maximum flame spread value and maximum smoke developed value. And really, uh, not all PEX is the same, not all polypropylene is the same. Um, some, pipes meet the t some pipes meet the test. In fact, most of them do, but each manufacturer has to get their pipe tested and certified to that standard to be able to comply with that section of the building code and B214 for being, for being allowed to put the pipe up in the return air plenum. So whatever pipe you're using, don't just take it for granted that it's been tested and approved for that application. Uh, you pretty much have to ask the pipe manufacturer, hey, do you have a certificate or listing to uh, CAN ULC S102.2? And if the manufacturer hasn't done the test on the pipe for that application, then you're probably not allowed to use it up in the return air plenum. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, uh, Lance being with DPI is, is a big fan of plastic, as are we. Uh, we want to make sure it gets used in the right applications. Uh, we have some Nupi photos here just because Nupi is a, a really uh, unique product. Uh, what's unique about them is electrofusion, so you can do a lot of large diameter piping and you don't have to worry about socket fusion or butt fusion. Uh, but like with anything, make sure whatever product you're using meets the code. It has to have, as Lance says, that, that flame and smoke rating. Uh, and understand that that doesn't mean you can't use a product, it means you need to use it properly. So that drop ceiling that you look at and go, hey, that's just a drop, uh, drop ceiling, Oh, no, that actually is the return air. So uh, be aware of what you're using, whether it's uh, RALPAX or whether it's uh, new PPR or whatever it may be. Uh, make sure you're dealing with your designers and in our case, your supplier to make sure that we're uh, providing you a product that makes sense for that application. So not everything works for sort of every scenario. Yeah, and Michael, for a lot of the plastic pipe materials, the way they uh, achieve that certification, that listing, is they're tested with like a half inch thick fiberglass wrap insulation around the pipe. Um, and that fiberglass wrap actually protects the pipe against flame, which is a good thing. And by the way, you're probably gonna be using insulation on the pipe anyway, because if you're pipe, running pipe through a return air plenum, it's probably a cold water pipe or a hot water pipe, in which case you need to insulate it anyway. So it's not like you have to do something special, um, but you just have to make sure that you're using the type of insulation that was included in the flaming smoke spread test. Uh, to yeah, make that's, sure that's, a, that's a great addition, Lance. So we have a job that's uh, ongoing right now with a plumber. Uh, he's, he's using the new PPPR. Uh, he's not running it in a, a return plenum or a supply. Uh, they're insulating it, obviously, because they're running hot water up to the building. So, you know, they're, they're ticking all the boxes. Uh, you know, you just got to make sure whatever product you're using, that not only are you familiar with the codes and standards, but the application of that product. And that's where you want to lean on your manufacturers, lean on your suppliers to make sure they give you the guidance you need. Uh, and like Lance and I said at the beginning, if we touch on something that later you're like, oh, I've got a follow up question, uh, punch in the question box, send me an email. You know, we're, we're trying to make this go quickly, but by all means, we're happy to help more down the road. Uh, this is a really good one. Uh, is there a risk of oversizing radiant pipes and a slow flow rate? So there actually is, and it took me a while before I realized this, but the nature of radiant heating pipes or snow and ice melt pipes or geothermal pipes for that matter, is that we're actually trying to transfer heat through the wall of the pipe. Unlike pipe just you know moving heat from one end of the building to the other, uh, supplying a fan coil, you're not trying to transfer heat through the wall of the pipe if you're just supplying a fan coil, that's the fan coil's job is to spread the heat out. So, but if you have water moving too slowly through a piece of plastic pipe or copper pipe or steel pipe, um, you can end up getting what's called laminar flow. And laminar flow means that the water is not mixing inside the pipe. It's going smooth and steady, which sounds like a great thing. Imagine all the, tra all the traffic on the 401 all going the same speed, nice and slow. 
The problem is if you're in the five lane section of the 401 and you're in the middle lane and you're trying to get off the 401 to an exit, it's really hard to move your way over to the exit off ramp if everybody's going at the same speed. You can't get out. You stay trapped in the middle. Um, and that happens with heat inside pipes if you've got laminar flow with all the water moving at the same speed. So there's actually a, a theoretical way of calculating how fast do I need my water to go uh, to get turbulent flow, which is the opposite of laminar flow. And you actually want turbulent flow in a radiant teething pipe or snow melt pipe or ground source geothermal pipe, because with turbulent flow, the water is churning and mixing inside the pipe, which does create slightly higher pressure loss, but it also means that you've always got the same temperature water touching the inside surface of the pipe. Because the problem with laminar flow is if it's moving so slowly, you can actually get this uh, really slow, slow moving water touching the pipe wall due to friction, which is called a boundary layer. And it's moving so slowly that it actually cools down to the temperature of the pipe and it ends up insulating the pipe and preventing heat transfer through the pipe wall. So there's ways of calculating how fast do I need my water to go. Uh, you calculate something called a Reynolds number, which people in, in the geothermal world have been doing this for years anyway. And in the previous edition of B214, back in 2016, um, the committee added a whole new chapter of Annex D on minimum flow rates through heat transfer pipes. And I've got some example numbers here from B214. So for instance, for half inch PEX, um, it turns out that you have, you have a minimum flow rate of 0.21 gallons per minute, and that's a US gallon per minute. That's uh, equivalent to 0.8 liters per minute. And if the water is traveling at a lower flow rate than that inside the pipe, you're probably gonna get laminar flow and then you'll actually have trouble getting the heat out of the pipe. Now, the flow rate that that's equivalent to is 0.1 feet per second. So that's a really, really low number. If somebody is thinking, oh my God, I've never done those calculations before. I wonder if my systems are working. They're probably working fine because most of the time we're designing our systems for higher flow rates than that anyway. Uh, if you go back to that design drawing you had a few minutes ago, Michael, did that show flow rates, the velocity through the water in that table? It doesn't show the velocity, but it shows the flow rates. So, you know, okay. as, as a heat pump guy, Reynolds numbers comes up all the time. We're designing ground loops for residential jobs, uh, 50 ton fire halls, like we get into a lot of stuff. In in the hydronic world, it's it's all tied around velocities. We know if we stay in that two to four feet per second, we don't have to worry about the Reynolds number. You start right. uh, sizing ground loops, they get buried. You, you know, it's really hard to go and fix after the fact and you have to have really good heat transfer, that, that Reynolds number becomes really important. As Lance, you were talking, I was doing the math in my head going, how could I get the Reynolds number that low in half inch pipe? And honestly, systems are so over pumped anyways, I, I think we would struggle in a residential job. But again, if you take residential methodologies and start putting into commercial applications, you can end up in this nightmare uh, quite quickly. To Lance's point, I actually went out and tried to find a video that sort of illustrates this. So we're going to play this short snippet of this video. And uh, I apologize for the sound, which I'm going to mute. Uh, so this is captured in the Italian Alps. Uh, so what you can see is the water coming out of this pipe is frozen, or at least that's what it looks like as you stare at this and go, yeah, this is a frozen bit of water uh, coming out of a pipe. Uh, it's actually just laminar. Like it's actually not moving at all. You see as he puts his hand in it, you can go, wow. So this is not what Lance and I are talking about exactly, but we want you to get a good understanding of what laminar flow looks like. It's, it's literally, you have the outside water, it's just, it's not moving in the way that you would expect it to. And you're obviously not getting any heat transfer. It's insulating, or in this case, it looks like it's defying gravity. Yeah, can I give a, a plug, Michael? Um, so within PPI, we have an online calculator that's free, anybody can use it and it works for PEX or PERD or CPVC or polypropylene, and you can enter in the flow rate you want and the size, diameter pipe, the length that will do pressure loss calculations, all these other things, and it also tells you what the velocity is. Um, so if anybody wants to check that out, just go to plasticpipecalculator.com, and that'll take you directly to the web page for that calculator, plasticpipecalculator.com, um, and it's free, so anybody can play around with that. As a tool. Awesome. Yep. No, it's a good tool. I've, I've certainly played with it. We got a whole bunch of different tools we like to use for when people call and say, hey, 
uh, this is what I got. There's certainly rules of thumbs for various things. I can't think of any rules of thumb for what we're talking about today. Today is let's uh, let's follow the proper procedure and methods to get things to work properly. So speaking of rules of thumb, if you want to get yourself into big trouble, do a rating for a cooling system using rules of thumb. Uh, so Lance, th this has come up in the past. Uh, where do people actually get guidance about a rating for a cooling system? Well, a lot of the manufacturers, uh, the PEX to be manufacturers, will have some good guidance on radiant cooling. Um, and some of them even have designers that focus on radiant cooling. A lot of radiant cooling up to now has been done in commercial buildings or institutional buildings like government offices, schools, train stations, things like that, um, because you can afford to have sophisticated controls in those buildings. But in the Western climates, whether that be Alberta, Saskatchewan, or a lot of parts of the US, um, your chance of condensation of getting a wet floor or wet wall are really, really low because the relative humidity in the space is just so low. Um, you'd have to literally freeze the floor to be able to get that kind of condensation. So, so there's a lot of science involved with radiant cooling. Um, and you can actually find a very good write-up of that. Also in B214, there's a new section in there called Annex C, I guess C for cooling. Um, and that's about a, it's just a two-page chapter of the, gu of the, of the code but it does provide some good guidance on radiant cooling. And one of the most important numerical items in that Annex C is about the minimum floor surface temperature. So just like with radiant heating, we have a maximum floor surface temperature. We also have a minimum floor surface temperature for human comfort. And this comes from European studies. It's also in the ASHRAE standard 55 that we talked about earlier. And it's 64 degrees Fahrenheit or 19 degrees Celsius is the, I'm sorry, 66 degrees Fahrenheit is 19 degrees Celsius. That's the minimum floor temperature that's allowed. Um, and that's for human comfort because a floor that's cooler than that will just feel uncomfortable, even if you have shoes on, just like walking on cold concrete uh, all day long. Um, it would just be uncomfortable. But I did a couple of dew point calculations because people are always concerned about. Uh, reaching the dew point and making sure we don't get wet walls or ceilings or floors. And I actually found this really good calculator. If you just go to dpcalc.org, um, you have these sliding bars you can use to put in your temperature and your relative humidity of the air. So, for example, in a residential application, if you have 70, 75 degree Fahrenheit indoor air and 40% relative humidity, which um, that's comfortable, 40 to 60% relative humidity. That's kind of the target for indoors for a lot of people. That results in a dew point of 49 degrees, which means your floor would have to be 49 degrees Fahrenheit before you would actually get condensation on the floor. That's outrageously cold. Nobody would live with that. Obviously, you never, you never need that much cooling. Um, so you can get a lot of cooling capacity without having a very cold floor. Uh, and it doesn't feel like much if you walk into a building with radiant cooling and it's operating. You don't necessarily step inside there and say, oh, wow, I feel my heat being sucked into the floor. Um, in fact, the best def definition of comfort is the lack of discomfort. So in the buildings I've been in with radiant cooling, you don't know why you feel comfortable. You just know that there's nothing making you uncomfortable and, and, and you move on. Um, if the system is set up right, it just finds a nice, good thermodynamic balance with your body. and and everything is okay. Um, so that was a long answer to your very short question. <laughs> Where do I get guidance? Annex C, uh, but that's some of the information that you'd find in Annex C. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of good tools out there. Um, obviously, Robert Bean has done some of these sessions. I think Lance, you hopefully participated in some of those. I think you have. Uh, so he has a lot of great tools. So uh, if at the end of this, you're you know looking for more tools, by all means, email me. Uh, everybody should have my email address. Um, I will make sure when I send an email out that we include some of these links, uh, so just so everybody has them. Um, and if you can just repeat that last link you gave for the cooling calculator, just for people who do want to write it down. It was dp, as in dewpointcalc.org, dpcalc.org. Perfect. So I, I think the big takeaway with radiant cooling is, uh, well, you know what, radiant in general, it shouldn't be a, a rule of thumb thing. Uh, just because you've done it this way a long time and nobody's called you back, and that doesn't mean it's the best method. Where where I uh, lose a lot of sleep over radiant cooling is, you know, if, if you start to make that floor 
condense. Uh, it, it's not like a radiant heating system where it's like, ah, you know, I'm not the most comfortable in the coolest day. You can do significant damage to a building by doing a radiant cooling system, especially in a house, uh, incorrectly. It's, it's not something you want to do without engineering, uh, without proper controls. It is definitely not something you want to do. Uh, sort of, you know, rule of thumb, as they say. There's a few things you can do that, you know, play into radiant cooling. I threw a couple of examples in here. Uh, one would be like a trench style uh, cooling rad, which is what you can see on the left-hand side. Um, and the other option you have is, again, a contained unit that's recessed into the wall. We see these going to a lot of high-end homes. They're using heat pumps as the source to do heating and cooling. Uh, so the one in the photo on the right-hand side is a breezing unit. So they'll recess them in the wall. You don't physically see them. They'll recess them in the ceiling. Uh, or same thing, they'll do a, a trench rat. So this is radiant cooling that I don't lose sleep over. This is a engineered system. Uh, the potential for you to cause harm or, or damage to the building is, is basically non-existent, uh, short of not installing it following the guidelines. But even then, um, you know, this is a really good alternative that you can start doing radiant cooling, uh, you know, without having to worry about some of the things we're talking about with, uh, with dew point. So. On that point, uh, I think we've pretty much covered everything that we wanted to. So, uh, Lance, I certainly appreciate you making the time. Before I jump to questions, is there anything you'd like to add that uh, maybe has peaked in your head that we talked about that we should clarify, or would you like me to move right to questions? <laughs> um, I don't know, maybe just one of the most practical examples, uh, since we talked a lot about Radiant today, even though CSE B214, it's hydronics, all of hydronics, not just Radiant. Um, but, you know, one of the most uh, real life examples of how does Radiant feel is driving in your car. Um, most of our cars nowadays have dual zone climate controls. And that's because if you're the driver in the car and you're in the sunny side of the car, which means the sun is beating in your driver's window and making you warm, you're probably going to want the air temperature cooler. Whereas your partner on the other side of the car, if they're on the shady side, not getting that sun, they're probably going to feel colder and they're going to want a lot more heat delivered to them on their side, whether that's through a heated seat or more hot air. Um, anybody can always just use that as an example as to uh, how does radiant heat feel? Um, because yeah, if you've got the sun beating down on you, you're comfortable with a much lower air temperature than if you're in the shade. The example I like to use, Lance, in training is the fireplace conversation. Uh, and I don't mean an indoor fireplace uh, or, or fire, I shouldn't say fireplace. You know, if I sit outside, I don't do a lot of camping, it's clear. So if I sit outside around my fireplace, uh, but if you're sitting outside in a fire, it can be very cool outside. It doesn't matter where you're sitting in relation to that fire. Like as long as you're sitting by that fire, that radiant heat is, you know, it's keeping you nice and warm, you're comfortable. It can be zero degrees out, it doesn't matter. You know, you see people that go skiing and they're, they're wearing shorts and no t-shirt. It's the, again, the same conversation. You know, thermal comfort is different for everybody. Uh, the elderly have different needs, uh, just like small children have different needs. So there's a lot of great courses you can take on that. Uh, John Siegenthaler does one with us every year where we spend some time talking about it, as does Robert Bean. So we certainly encourage you to uh, walk away from our one hour webinar and seek out more knowledge. And as I said at the beginning, if we finish the Q&A period and you think of something, uh, by all means, send me an email and Lance and I will put our heads together and we'd be happy to help you. We are firm believers in, in sharing knowledge and, and gaining knowledge. Lance and I will get as much from talking with you guys on the phone by email uh, as hopefully you will get from spending uh, an hour with us. So on that note, I'm going to move to some questions, Lance. Sure. Uh, James is asking, uh, what is the purpose of putting the plastic pipes through the return plenum? And James, I'll just clarify, we're talking about a commercial application. Uh, so in my experience, and Lance will weigh on this too, it really just comes down to, uh, you know, the space in the building. They're trying to figure out where are we going to run this piping? The most obvious place is to put it up in the drop ceiling. Um, Lance, what would be your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, just imagine like a, a school or large office building or something where you've got hydronic convectors, maybe distributing heat throughout the building, and you've got maybe two or three inch diameter pipes. Um, that have to be run to all the different classrooms or office rooms or something like that. And it's very common to install those pipes just hanging from the ceiling inside the return air plenum. So that's why the pipes are in there in the first place. Um, Stuart, uh, good to see you, Stuart. He is asking, uh, what type of insulation do you recommend for distribution piping in residential hydronic cooling applications? 
So the insulation under the floor, is that what the question is about, you think? Uh, I'm going to say it's not, it's distribution pipe. So where you're running that piping and you're insulating it. So key thing there, Stuart, is absolutely it needs to be insulated. You will end up with a heck of a mess. Um, what would be your guidance on that, Lance? I think the most important thing is to have an insulation with a waterproof coating, basically an air barrier. Uh, I think air barrier is the right term. I'm not an expert expert on insulation, but uh, what you don't want is for condensation to be happening on the pipe inside the insulation. And this applies whether it's copper pipe or steel pipe or plastic pipe. Um, you don't want any, you, you know, you don't want transfer of, of moisture molecules passing through that pipe so you get condensation on the pipe itself. So uh, it could be the Armaflex type insulation I think is fine, the fiberglass insulation is fine, but as long as there's a, uh, an air barrier on the outside of it to stop air from moving through the insulation I think is the important thing. Yeah, Stuart, a product that uh, our team uses is called uh, Golfo Flex. Uh, so we'll use that on our heat pumps where we're doing uh, chilled water um, and, and for that matter, heated water. Uh, if you reach out to either myself or somebody on the team, we can share some more information on it. It's a pretty cost effective uh, method to do it. Uh, again, going back to Lance's point of, of making sure we tick all the boxes that it meets what we require. Um, Adam's weighed in with a question. Uh, he's saying, hey, I missed the first few minutes. It's okay, it's good to see you, Adam. Uh, he is seeing where engineers are specking R20 under the basement floor. Uh, so Adam missed out on the first part where we talked about insulation. Uh, he's also, so two part, um, first part is, is there a diminishing return situation on insulation? And the second is R20 too much, too much. So I'll take the first part and then we'll let Lance weigh in on the R20. Um, there is a diminishing return. Um, you know, you, you don't want to get to the point where you've now priced that job, uh, out of the scope of reality. We would much rather you meet the CSA minimum, uh, and put that money into other things that are going to make that system work better, like indoor temperature feedback. Etc. But certainly, uh, there's not a scenario where, oh my goodness, you screwed up. We only wanted R10, and you've done R30. You know, you have to realize that that minimum code. You know, the, the joke is that's just the minimum to make sure nobody sues you. There's varying degrees of beyond that where you can improve upon the system. So, Lance, would you say under the new CSA B214 that R20 is is not required and is a bit over-engineered? What would you be your thoughts? What would you like to see? So yeah, wearing different hats or thinking of different hats. Um, first answer is yes, R20 is far beyond what B214 requires. And the technical committee for B214 does talk about this a lot, but this committee has settled that R5 is enough for the vast majority of rating teething installations. I mean, the truth is, if you can afford to put more insulation, um, doing more than R10 under the floor is probably beyond the point of diminishing returns, and you may be better off putting that insulation in the attic where you lose a lot of heat through a house or in the walls on the north side of the house or something like that. Um, there was a requirement though in Alberta, I think a few years ago to have, I think a minimum of R16 or R20 insulation under heated floors, but that's been done away with. Um, that was in, I'm not gonna state it right, but that was in like the Alberta Provincial Building Code but the province issued a stand data document a couple of years ago to change that. I think they're down to R10 in Alberta as the minimum required under heated floors. So I'm not aware of anybody that requires more than R10 under heated floor. Perfect. Um, so Jim's got a question. Jim actually just wanted to point out he really liked your explanation of uh, state law where I was making my commentary about being constipated, he liked your comparison to the emitter, uh, as did I, and I'm sure uh, I'm not alone. Jim's not alone. Um, so Jim's question is, uh, are you going to show the best location for a floor sensor uh, and the best way to install them? So I'll give a little two cents and then hand it off to Lance. Um, so obviously sleeving, it's a really good idea. Uh, sleeving in a piece of pack so you can easily get it in, get it out. Uh, I will throw out a big no-no and then Lance can throw in the big please do. Uh, so the no-no that we see quite a bit is that uh, the installers will put that sensor down and for ease of a place to strap it, they'll strap it to the pipe. So uh, there's there's good, bad, or, uh, and uh, really bad. Uh, obviously, you don't want to be doing that. Lance, where would you see as being the best possible spot to put the sensor? 
I've typically recommended, because I've heard this from others, from the people that make the sensors, um, to locate the sensors halfway between the pipes. So halfway between the pipes is technically the coolest area of the floor structure, because that's equidistant farther, you know, far, equidistant away from the two, uh, the two heated pipes. But um, that's where I've seen a lot of people put them. I mean, I also uh, get a lot of my guidance when it comes to controls from the Techmark company because that's their focus and they have years and years of experience in this field. There's lots of other great control companies out there as well. But I believe that's been there, uh, been that there. I, I believe that has been their recommendation. Let me get those words out in the right order. <laughs> yeah, if you're doing an on the floor style system, sort of like the RAL panel and the RAL board that we saw, uh, I would do the same thing. I can tell you in my own installations in my home, uh, I would just use a wood chisel and do exactly as, as Lance said. I would make sure my sensor is between the pipes, not touching the aluminum, not touching the pipes. Uh, I try to centralize it a little bit because you know I, I want it in a, a good spot in the room, but really I'm more worried about how close is it to those pipes as, as Lance is pointing out, or to the heat transfer plates. I don't want the sensor sitting right on top of the heat transfer plate if I can help it. Um, Alvin has a question. So Alvin's saying uh, the two in depth, is that the rule of thumb uh, or is there a range? Uh, I believe Alvin's referring to the distance between the, the top and where the pipe is sitting in the slab. So in that case, I think that number comes from an ASHRAE handbook, the ASHRAE chapter on radiant heating design. Um, also, John Sickenthaler has done lots of experiments on that over the years using both thermal cameras and finite element analysis. Uh, so I think people are saying two to three inches down from the top surface. So there's a range. Um, if you, do, if you go too close to the top surface of the concrete, then there's more of a chance of getting warm spots directly above the tubing and cooler spots in between the tubing. So you do want the tubing down sufficiently low so that the concrete has enough space between the tubing to absorb all, all the heat and kind of spread it out to give you an, an even surface temperature. Um, but yeah, two to three inches is the range that is ideal Lots of systems have it four inches down from the top, and obviously that works perfectly well. It's just not as optimal as three inches down. Yeah, Alvin, the fun part, uh, Lance and I talk uh, quite frequently. Um, you know, when we prepare these presentations, we sort of have the moment of, I wonder how many people actually do this, you know? And I would suggest that uh, in the installations we're involved in, which is not a small amount, it's likely that it's the bottom of the pipe or the bottom of the concrete the bulk of the times it's, it's still going to work um you know it, you want to try to do it as, as good as you can uh you just have to be careful you ever run into a situation where it's an architectural dream house uh and they've got 10 inches of concrete and you're in the bottom of it Whew. again rules of thumb are dangerous things like that's that's definitely not going to work very good for you um, if you come up with a scenario, Alvin, where you want to talk about it, by all means, reach out uh, and we'll go through it with you. Uh, Josh had a really good question. So he's going back to the circulators that we had earlier. I had a photo of a, a Maxo pump and a Taco pump. Uh, he wanted to know why I picked a 0018. And, and maybe I'll just go back a slide, Lance, so we can see it while we're talking here. There we go. So his question was, uh, why have you picked uh, the 0018 instead of the 0015? Uh, and really, there is uh, no reason for it. Um, the 0018 is actually a better circulator. What I like about it is I can connect to it through Bluetooth, and I can tell that pump, this is where I need you to be on the curve, and it's it's going to be exactly uh, where Lance has designed the system to be. But really, uh, a 0015, a 0018, an Alpha, a Velo, you know, we're not trying to be brand uh, specific here. Any of those would work in this application, or just a, a simple bypass as uh, as Lance has talked about already. So anything to add to that, Lance, or? Nope. Perfect. Uh, Josh also says boo in Joyce. So he is like us, he's not a huge fan of in Joyce. Uh, I know Josh is an installer and I know that he's done route plate and would be uh, the first to say, doing a, a plate that holds both pipes is way less time, way less labor. Um, so good for you, Josh. Thanks for sharing the good questions. Um, bear with me a section. Uh, Josh just jumped back in and said, did you just answer my question? Yes, Josh, you'll have to watch the video. <laughs> he had some audio problems. Uh, Peter is saying, are there any pre-insulated PEX products for distribution piping? 
I'll give you two uh, that I'm very biased towards, and then I'll give you Lance, who will give you unbiased. Uh, so Ralpex, uh, they have a, an OWB product, so that's a, they have an Insulvex product as well. So it's an insulated PEX that comes in a variety of different sizes, so we would use that. Uh, we've got a job right now where it's a, a very large house uh, with a guest house off the back of it, have to put two boilers in. We'll have one mechanical plant. We're going to run some OWB to the back guest house. We'll heat it that way. Uh, the other thing that we will see is people using uh, insulated PPR. I'm going to re-emphasize the word insulated PPR, not just buried PPR. Uh, you can get uh, pre-insulated PPR products through Loopy. Uh, so both would be uh, a great application. Lance, now that we've named the products we offer, can you offer a uh, unbiased answer? <laughs> Well, when it comes to, so if we're talking about buried piping over long distances, um, a flexible pipe like pre-insulated PEX uh, obviously is convenient because it saves a lot of connections, a lot of joints, not just the joints in the pipe, but also the joints and the waterproof coating on the outside um, if you get to use a continuous pipe. But most of the PEX manufacturers do have access to pre-insulated pipe uh, with, their, with their carrier pipe inside. Most of that is produced in Europe because they do a lot of district heating on small scale and big scale in Europe. So most of the pipe comes from Europe, but uh, it's the PEX manufacturers that everybody is familiar with. So uh, Ubinor has it, Watts has it, Vega has it, uh, obviously Ray Howe, uh, all, the big, all the big PEX companies have it. Yeah, so my rule of thumb, and obviously we, we supply Ray Howe and we supply Nupi, is uh, if it's up to inch and a half, I'm typically gonna do an insulated uh, OWB or Insulpex. Anything larger than that, it's actually easier to do a PPR product, uh, the Electrofusion PPR, pre-insulated. And I, I'm glad Lance pointed out that it's really important on those joints, like make sure that you're not uh, you know, penetrating that insulation. Uh, we can have a whole lengthy conversation about various products that are better in different applications. But uh, if you're doing it for the first time, Peter, just give me a call or shoot me an email. Uh, we can have a conversation about your specific project. Lance and I are just sort of summarizing here. Uh, very quickly. Um, John has a good question. Uh, he wants to clarify the insulation under a heated floor is R5 required for a concrete floor as well as a system above a wooden subfloor such as RAL panel or overboard. So yeah. I'll touch quickly on the RAL panel and then Lance if you can touch quickly again on insulation under concrete and insulation under a, a raised uh, middle floor. So one of the unique things about RAL panel is it is one of those products where you actually can put it down on a concrete floor. Uh, it, because it's not making a lot of contact with the surface of the floor, it actually is an air gap that separates the panels um, from the concrete. Uh, RAL board where it's sitting right on the floor, I mean, it's getting as much heat transferred down as it is up, so it needs good insulation. And Lance, if you could just repeat again for the basement, what our insulation requirements would be, and for a raised floor where we're doing a, a RAL board or a staple up, what kind of insulation we should have? Well, in both cases, it's R5. Sure. So R5 under a heated slab and R5 under a heated main floor of a house if it's over a conditioned space down below. Um, in the RAL panel case, um, that's kind of an exception because uh, there's nothing that allows you to skip into the insulation under that. From B214's perspective, you'd almost have to convince the local enforcement agency, your building inspector, that RAL panel doesn't actually need the R5 underneath because of the fact that it's it's mostly an air cavity underneath it, which is five little legs holding it up. Yeah, for sure. So obviously, uh, John, if we can add on that, you can uh, send us an email uh, and we'd be happy to respond uh, after the fact. Um, Craig has got a really short but sweet comment uh, or question of expansion tanks. Um, so I think he's trying to hint at what does CSA say about expansion tanks? Well, uh, I can say you need one. Uh, <laughs> Lance, is, uh, are we able to summarize this or do we need Craig to fill out the question a bit more? Well, yeah, you obviously need them. Um, there is chapter seven of B214 is all about expansion tanks. Uh, from the beginning, it says, a closed loop in a hydronic heating system shall employ an expansion tank and a pressure relief valve. So that's each individual closed loop. Um, and then beyond that, it provides more detailed requirements about the type of tank and where the tank goes and things like that. But 
it's, it's yeah, not so a, Craig, I mean, not ex expansion tanks are probably the least expensive component you're going to put in your hydronic system. Uh, they could also be the least understood. Uh, case in point is when you call the wholesaler and say, hey, I need an expansion tank. How many BTUs you got? And, you know, and Lance and I look at each other and go, well, there's no BTUs in the formula, so it's got nothing to do with it. That, again, is, is a rule of thumb. Now, that's a rule of thumb that's, that's pretty effective. You know, the manufacturers use it. Uh, typically, what will happen is you'll end up with an expansion tank that's, that's too big for your application. Uh, expansion tanks are important for a whole variety of reasons. We actually just did a, a training session on that. So, Craig, if you have a specific question, email me. Um, I'll actually shoot you the video for the last, uh, the link to the video for the last training session, or we can just jump on a phone call and talk about whatever expansion tank questions that you might have. Yeah, there's um, never, there's never a risk in oversizing one, but there's obviously a big risk in undersizing the expansion tanks. Yeah, and there's some pretty easy rule of thumbs you can use that have nothing to do with BTUs. Like we can give you a few guidelines on that, but as I said, I don't want to drag this into an expansion tank conversation for the other many folks who are here. Um, we do have a lot of other questions I'm going to skim through. So if I miss somebody's question, I can say certainly send me an email. Uh, Lance and I will answer all the questions by uh, by email after the fact. Um, as, as you're looking there, uh, back to the question about pipe insulation. Yes. Uh, believe it or not, there's a trade association for insulation. And they even publish a monthly magazine, <laughs> which, which I get and I read uh, to learn more about that topic. So if anybody wants, you can just go to insulation.org. Um, and I think that's the website of the National Association of Insulation Manufacturers or something like that, whatever they're called. Uh, but you could get a lot of information about the different types of insulation from that website. Um, and I apologize if I'm going to mispronounce your name. So Rashdeep, I hope I got that right. I apologize up front, um, is saying we often get questions on the vertical slab edge insulation uh, and finishing the perimeter. Any suggestions? Uh, I like that you're getting that question. I'm going to refer back again, uh, maybe forward. So this is a, you know, not a, a, a technical uh, engineering submittal, but we have these in a better format uh, for just about every application where it shows proper dimensions, proper insulation requirements. So we would have this for SIM, we would have this for insulation, we would have this for, you name the scenario, we've got it. Um, so if you want to send me an email reminder after, uh, I'd be happy to share some drawings that maybe can help you with your designs. Uh, and obviously, you can ask uh, any questions at that time. Do you have any advice, uh, Lance, on the finishing perimeter? Like, if you had two things you would like people to do uh, in this illustration I'm showing, forgetting it's sim, we'll say it's in the house. What would you say are the two things you'd really like to see them do on the, the perimeter insulation? On so, the edge, me. Yeah, so number one, don't skip it. Um, <laughs> because as you said before, a tremendous amount of thermal loss can go out through the edges of the slab. Huge amount of wasted energy can go out there. What I've seen some people do, so if the question is really about not wanting to see the insulation after the concrete is poured, what I've seen some people do is uh, basically the top of the insulation, just chamfer it at a 45 degree angle, uh, slice it down at a 45 degree angle, that vertical board, and then as you pour the concrete, the concrete then tapers off and covers the top of the insulation so that you don't actually see it. Um, so that's in an unfinished basement where it might be exposed. But if it's gonna be a finished basement, by the time you put your two by four stud walls inside the basement and actually put your walls up, normally that would cover that insulation interface anyway, I think. Yeah, that's actually what he's leading to. And in fact, Josh, another one of our, uh, our folks on here had the same conversation of how do I make that look good but in a snow melt application? Uh, where you've got this insulation on the end of your driveway and oh. really what lance is saying is it makes a lot of sense and you can angle that so that by the time the, the driveway is completed uh, depending on what kind of driveway you're doing um, but certainly to arash deep and again i apologize if i'm not saying your name right uh that's a really good suggestion lance that's a great way to make it uh, look uh, reasonable well and let me point out one thing that five years ago um it was actually removed from b214 the requirement to have insulation on snow melt systems um, because of the practicality of, of, of all that. I mean, if you had exposed insulation at the edge of your driveway and then you're using the weed whacker all summer long, that blue board is going to be blowing all over the place. Um, and for a typical driveway uh, or a lot of other outside areas, 
again, these are on off systems. The amount of heat lost out through the edges is much lower, uh, much lower amount of heat. So it's not really required. And in fact, it's literally been taken out of B214, so it's not required at all. And the truth is, if you do lose, lose some heat out the edge of your heated concrete driveway, that's going to thaw the earth against the edge of that slab, which allows the water to drain off better. So as you're melting the snow, that water has to drain off somewhere. Um, it can't drain into frozen earth very well, but it can drain into thawed earth quite well. So, so yeah, you don't, have to, you don't have to do the slab insulation on a snowmelt system. The edge insulation. Uh, 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 sorry, edge insulation. Edge. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We got to keep each other straight. I meant to say edge insulation. We almost missed out on insulation there. <laughs> uh, and so, just as a follow-up, and it's Arshdi is how you pronounce it. Thank you. Hopefully, I got it correct that time. Is saying that uh, when they chamfer, uh, usually the concrete chips where the insulation is. So that's why he's uh, he's asking the question. Yeah, I don't have a better solution for that. I'm not. Uh, I'm not the builder. I'm mostly a pipe guy, so um, <laughs> I, I can. I can understand that because concrete does tend to crack wherever there's any kind of a stress concentration point. Um, so I don't know. I would have to talk to well, some builder. I, I know who I'll go to. So follow up with me after this session. Uh, I'll have a conversation with Gord Cookstein because they will 100% know the answer to this, and uh, we'll, we'll all learn something. I will share the answer with you, Lance, because like you, I'm not a builder, but uh it's not the first time i've been asked this question and uh i'm sure it'll come up again um another question we've got why was it change uh from r12 to r5 under the floor when it's uh, over a condition space um i think the main, again i'm not speaking for the whole committee but as i recall the conversations i think it was simply the recognition that r12 is too much you just don't need r12 insulation in that case when it's condition space down below um, it's kind of a waste of insulation. So R5 was recognized as being enough. And I think I think it was actually R12 in the first place, based on uh, possibly based on a misunderstanding of joist space heating versus above the floor panel systems. As you can imagine, there's a big difference in how those systems perform and where the heat's going to go. If you're putting your tubing under the floor as opposed to putting your tubing on top of the floor in a panel system um, and in the earlier versions of b214 you didn't even find uh, a lot of titles in all the different sections so sometimes it was even difficult to figure out what section am i reading right now but in this edition of b214 uh, title sections have been added virtually everywhere so now it's more clear exactly which section is addressing which which installation topic perfect well lance i think we did a, a pretty good time uh getting the questions it doesn't appear that i've missed any of them uh if i have to everybody who's attending you have my email uh some of you i'm sure have my phone number uh feel free to follow up that's uh that's what we're here for um if you're looking for some content after the fact uh, we typically upload these training sessions a few weeks to a month after the fact onto our YouTube channel. Uh, it's not hard to find us. It's just youtube.com slash Eden Energy Equipment. Um, Lance and I have been doing training sessions now. It feels like every month. Uh, it might be every, every month and a half. So uh, if you enjoy these training sessions, you'll get a follow-up email tomorrow uh, telling you about our next session. I'll be doing a uh, control session in a month. Uh, you'll also get a link to sign up for future training dates. So the next time Lance and I are talking about uh, CSA or, or snow melt, or I think we're actually going to do something on PPR piping, uh, you won't miss out on that opportunity. And if you have any uh, specific needs or requests, as I say, don't hesitate to reach out. Lance, uh, instill some last minute wisdom to us before we wrap this up. <laughs> as Dan Houlihan always says, hug your kids. It's good wisdom. Okay. Good wisdom. I'm going to do that before I go back to the office. <laughs> Good plan. All right. Well, obviously, Lance, I appreciate you making the time. And uh, thank you to everybody who came. We had an awesome turnout. And uh, we appreciate everybody coming. Thanks, Michael. Thanks. Take care. See you.